so welcome to Quantum Leap uh, into 2021. We're very um, pleased to be able to introduce Warren Cass this morning to you. So Warren is a international thought leader, a speaker and a champion of small business. And he's about to give you a, a 45 minute presentation on titled Influence in a Changing World. And I'll, I'll pass over to, to Warren. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Good to see you all. We've, we've got a couple of people who've just joined as well in the meantime. If you have just joined, um, let us know where in the world you are. It'd be good to get some interaction going in the chat today. Uh, after all, this is a workshop as opposed to just me speaking at you. Um, and, and for everybody else, could you give me some context? What is it you do? What is it you sell? Pop it in the chat. Let us know a little bit more about what it is you actually deliver as a product or service. And while you're doing that, I will give you a quick bit of context as to who I am. So um, thanks for the introduction. My name is Warren Cass. I am a speaker, an author, um, and somebody who works with brands and businesses in order to uh, really nail their proposition, evolve and adapt and uh, take themselves to market, understanding their marketplace, etc. We do this through a brand called the Thought Leaders Blueprint. And my business partner is actually speaking this evening at eight o'clock around digital marketing. I encourage you to go and have a look at Warren Knight, a pair of Warrens. Um, and for those of you who know the joke, what do you call a man with a rabbit on his head? And of course the answer is Warren. Um, you wouldn't surprise you to know that um, our, our brand identity in, involves rabbits. Um, the brand that we, we operate is called the Thought Leaders Blueprint. And the Thought Leaders Blueprint really is a, a, about dissecting a business and looking at all of the things that are core to your identity. So that's the kind of purpose, values, the objectives of the business, the, the kind of pr professional um, aspect of what you do, uh, your intellectual property, all of that, and getting that nailed so your marketplace fully understands who you are, what you do, what, how you differentiate then building your methodology or model so you can articulate your value. It has great explanatory power when you have a model or methodology. Then you build your propositions around that. And then, of course, it's how you take it to market. That's essentially how we dissect uh, with the Thought Leaders Blueprint. And as you can see just from this slide, there's a lot to it. I mean, this is just scratching the surface. We cover a lot of, lot of areas with people. So it's, it's with all of this as a bit of context that I'm bringing you a presentation today to talk about change and to talk about some of the areas that you may find uh, have impacted you this year. Now, um, we work on this uh, competitive advantage framework, and this is really a, uh, a, a our model of, of around what you can do to uh, really stand out from the rest. And, and most, you can either look at this as an onion where you need to peel layers off, or you can look at it as a target where we need to be uh, laser focused to get to the middle. But the, the reality is most businesses sit around the outside and don't really do depth. And it's one of the things that really stops them from uh, really connecting with their audience. Uh, for example, most people will sell products and services around features and benefits. Uh, but they, they won't necessarily understand the importance of social proof today, that kind of evidence testimonial. They won't work on what reputation means and looks like. And I'm going to cover this today. Uh, we obviously see the world through the lens of educating your marketplace. So thought leadership, leading the thought process and creating the conditions where it's really, really easy for people to buy from you. And, uh, and even thinking that through from the kind of tone of voice and from the communication strategy you might have really being clear on what your brand personality is. So we're going to cover a, a bit of this today as well. Because the reality is society is changing. It's a massive understatement, actually big time. Uh, in fact, every, everybody's been impacted this year, um, but the reality is for the last 30 years, the pace of change has been, has been huge. Um, I mean, if you think about human history for the last 80 or 90,000 years, you know, whilst we've had um, spikes from industrial revolutions and you know, various other bits and bobs, it's actually been a very, very steady e evolution. And what technology has done is just accelerated everything. And I'm going to talk to you today about some of the trends that were predicted for 2020. But actually what's happened is load lockdown has completely accelerated those trends too. And, uh, and we'll explore a few of those things just because they just might be useful for you. 
So I'm going to give a bit of context of this change first. So over 40% 40, 40 of the business at the top of the Fortune 500 in 2000 were no longer there in 2010. Now that's that's um, just illustrating the change in the last 20 years. The reality is though, equally, there are brands that have come from absolutely nowhere and are immediately multi-million pound brands because they have absolutely understood change and they've been able to be in highly relevant for that change. Um, so we're gonna look at change, but particularly around technology behaviors and demographics today. And let's start with technology. So we have cloud, say big data, uh, mobile technology and social. Those four things have fundamentally uh, changed the way that we work. Cloud has re-engineered our, our relationship with software. Uh, big data was always the domain of big company and now actually all of us should have the kind of dashboards within our business and understanding the inter interrelationships. Of course, made more complex by things like GDPR. Um, mobilization has broken the shackles of the desk. We can work anywhere now. We're gonna look at some of the remote working aspects and trends. And social media has democratized communication. It really has leveled the playing fields on shoestring budgets. Now we can get out there and, and be relevant in the world. And um, the problem is that most people don't understand the changes in habits. Uh, I, mean, I'm, I mean, this is absolutely a true. Typical mobile users check their phones 150 times a day. Most of you will have something on your settings on your phone that if you go and click it, it will tell you how many hours a day you spend on your phone. Uh, you might just be completely shocked with what that number is. Uh, so I encourage you to look at it. You might be able to reclaim a little bit of life. Um, and it was actually 2014 where there were more mobile devices connected to the internet than there were people in the world. In fact, an interesting stat for you, there were more people in the world with smartphones than there are with flushing toilets, uh, which uh, just goes to tell you how the... Um, uh, the the demand for this technology. And while we're talking about toilets, according to Facebook, if you are a chap, you are more likely to sit down to go to the loo now, just so you can check your phone. These are the times that we live in, okay? So most people are, are living their lives and communicating through these mobile devices while they travel around everywhere. And we've got to be mindful that this is our, these are our marketplaces now, whether we like it or not, particularly younger generations. So let me give you some context around these, this changing demography and changing habits. There is a barometer for how long it takes a product or service to hit 50 million users. Now we know for the telephone, it was 75 years, the radio it was 38, the TV did it in 13, the iPod did it in four, the internet did it in three, Facebook did it in two years, the iPhone did it in three months. Now, if you think about every single one of these, they are an evolution in communication they made the next leap um, easier. Um, but uh, again, a bit more context, you know, um, world population has doubled since 1980. Um, so actually reaching other larger numbers is uh, uh, gonna be a part of that. But each one of these has made the next innovation easier to communicate. And don't believe me? Well, Angry Birds did it in 30 days. Pokemon Go did it in 19 days. And actually more recently, um, in fact, I've gone too far. The tracking app for COVID-19 for India alone did it in 13 days. Okay, so we we are able now to uh, really take uh, things, product services to market and to create almost viral content that engages with people. And, and, uh, um, and it's about understanding what's shareable, what, uh, what people are interested in. And a couple of examples of how not to do it. So uh, the two which I really like are Yell.com. Um, Yell uh, should have been Google in my humble opinion. They owned search before uh, the internet came along. There was nobody in the business saying, what's this thing gonna do to us? How is it gonna in impact the way people search for products and services? But if you think about Yell, they started in 1956 in Brighton. Uh, with one Brighton and Hove directory, spanned the UK, suddenly then on four continents with a HQ in Texas. And there was nobody in that multi-million pound business saying this disruption, what's it gonna do to us? And then if you think about Kodak, Kodak actually shot themselves in their own foot because Kodak invented the digital camera. That was the first prototype. And they made a bigger cardinal sin because they brought futurists into the business and they said to them, what's the future of photography? And they said, the future of photography is digital. And they said, that's not what we wanted to hear, you're fired. So it was a bigger cardinal sin for them too, being um, completely ignorant of that change. 
Let's move on to demographics. So many of you will be, uh, in fact, show of hands, just because some of you got your videos on, who is completely bored and fed up of the term millennial? Good, a few of us. Um, so the, the interesting thing here is whilst, uh, whilst millennials um, will agree with you, I think we might have one or two um, uh, viewing, but whilst millennials will also agree with you, the reason why we need to understand um, all of these things is we are living in times where right now we have five different generations in the workforce. It's never happened before. All with completely different attitudes uh, with technology, different experiences of business and technology and certainly relationships. And we need to be aware of this change, particularly if we are working with multi-demographics. If your customer base spans multi-generations, you need to understand the differences and opinions. So we're gonna look at some of these millennial attitudes. Well, let's start with some of the basics, marriage, mortgage, and kids. Now, the average age for these things back in the 1970s was about 23 years old. Today, it's about 36 years old. Okay, so people are getting married, buying houses, and having kids later. And there's lots and lots of factors influencing that. Money would be one of them. Um, but times are changing. Attitudes to these things have changed. Um, from a working point of view, uh, a couple of changes for you here. Only 7% of millennials work for the, the kind of corporation, Fortune 500 companies in the, in the US this status uh, comes from. Because millennials actually uh, are much more likely to go off and feather their own cap and create their own business. Um, or if they're going to work for somebody, they prefer to work for the smaller company and the entre entrepreneur at the helm of that company because they want to be connected to the purpose of the organization. So they're much more purpose um, centered in the way that they approach work. And uh, again, you know, huge, um, huge attitudes, uh, positive attitudes towards the side hustles. I'm going to share some of the stats around that in a minute, um, i.e. the gig economy stuff. From a political point of view, uh, much more likely to be uh, politically engaged at a younger age. Um, as misinformed as the rest of us, because we all uh, get presented echo chamber information and, and fake news and all of that stuff, which is a real, a real shame because this particular um, aspect of life, regardless of which way you swing on the political spectrum, make, means that we're all becoming more cynical of the information we're presented with and therefore more likely to go and due diligence on the people that we might do business with because we're cynical of what we're being uh, presented with from, a, uh, from an opinion point of view. Um, so the age of misinformation is making us all really wanting to go and make sure we've got our facts checked, which means right now that people are looking into you all of the time, regardless of whether you know it or not. And we live in huge diverse times too, um, which is you know, impacting um, the, the language, the way we communicate, political correctness, all of those things. But there is one thing that holds absolutely true. And that is if you are speaking to multiple demographics, but using one tone of voice with your marketing, your messaging, your communication, I guarantee you are not speaking to everybody. So the big idea here is that we need to understand our marketplaces. We need to understand the diversity that we speak to and where possible, we need to contextualize and personalize our message in order to really land with them. Okay. Because this one thing, context really matters. Now in digital marketing terms, contextual marketing is simply the premise that when we make a buying decision, there's a, there's a context to it, right? So if, um, if somebody hits your website um, and lands on a very specific page based on a search term they put into a search engine, more often than not, that's exactly what they're looking for. And the more that we can contextualize our messaging to, be, to really be um, impactful for those people, the more chance we've got of making a sale and taking them on our user journey. And I'll give you an example of this. There's a, a fellow speaker called Grant Liboff who was working with Stringfellows Nightclub. And Stringfellows made, um, made the assumption that um, uh, you know different times of the day, different people were looking, they wanted an expert to come in and help them. So they just made some assumptions. At 11 o'clock at night on a Friday night from a mobile IP address, if you are searching for Stringfellows website, chances are you're looking for something that relates to right now, um, directions, entry price, um, dress code, uh, whatever, it relates to right now. Um, and you can similarly maybe make the assumption that if you were looking at the Stringfellows website at nine o'clock on a Monday morning from a, from a fixed IP address, 
chances are you're planning an event for the future. Okay, so with those couple of assumptions, we can, we can have a dynamic front page that absolutely addresses the wants and the needs of the people searching for, for our website. And that was the project they did, which saw immediate, almost immediately a 30% uptake in engagement through the site just by being contextual. Now, I believe this goes well beyond digital. Context really, really matters. Context is about, um, in every, every single conversation in everyday life, context matters. Okay, uh, we are going to be far more impactful as a salesperson if we've taken the time to understand the wants and the needs of the person in front of us. For example, I could be in the market for a brand new car. Now, it could be I'm having a midlife crisis and I want a convertible. It could be, um, God forbid, there's uh, a new child in the family and we need more space. Mine have left home, so uh, God forbid... Um, that's why I, I mean that. It could be that I've had a crash, but I really need an immediate replacement, right? But the point is, as the salesperson, if I've taken the time to understand the context, I'm more likely to, make, to match a product or service that really meets my needs and is going to be exciting uh, because, it's a, because it's a match and therefore more likely to get the sale. Okay, so context really matters. Like if, I, if you leave with nothing else from today, I encourage you to think about the context of the people that you serve and uh, start to think about your messaging and really does it address that context, okay? Because the reality is the future speaks different language. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's, it's fairly, fairly, fairly obvious from uh, even just from some of the stuff I've said here already, but we'll look at some of the behaviors. I do like to pull this one out of the back, um, just normally to see who's old in my audience. I'm old. Um, who recognizes Ted Rogers and Dusty Bin? Uh, one or two. Um, so I, I give this just as an example to show some of the consumption behavior changes because this in 1980, uh, which is the birth year of millennials, right? In 1980, this was the biggest show on British TV. It was commanding audiences week in, week out of 18 million viewers. Okay, the biggest thing on TV today is probably I'm a celebrity, strictly, bake off, whatever. And on their finals, when they have their biggest audiences, they're getting about 13 million viewers. So, uh, you know, a different, quite a difference. Now, why is that? Well, back then we had a scarcity of choice, but we had an abundance of attention. So if you think about it, back then in 1980, it was before the remote control was mainstream and we had four TV channels. Okay, only two of them with adverts. But um, if you were watching a, a TV show which had adverts, you were capped if you probably sat there and you watched them. So marketing was a broadcast medium, and we typically were obedient, sat and, and received because attention um, uh, was um, abundant. Well, today we've got quite the opposite, okay? We have more choice than we know what to do with. Uh, we have concentration spans, which are really, really um, small, and actually typically... Uh, you'll be watching television with your phone in your hand or uh, you certainly if you're a, uh, a teenager you'll have probably probably three devices on the go um, and attention is a fiercely sought after commodity and for for people uh, who are running businesses this matters right um, and if you think about you know just the change youtube as one of the op opposites did you know there's been more original content uploaded to youtube in the last 24 hours than the top four American TV channels have aired since the 1930s. We are huge consumers of content. We are huge creators of content too. And uh, YouTube is the second biggest search engine on the planet, owned by the first biggest search engine on the planet. In fact, show of hands or in the chat, how many of you have got video for your business um, on the front page of your website? Um, if you haven't, you're missing a trick. Um, some of these um, metrics are changing, though. In fact, uh, one of the other speakers who's on tonight, uh, Barnaby Winter, and I were together yesterday, and he was showing me some recent research that shows for younger demographics, um, actually the second biggest search engine on the planet is now Instagram. And if you've got an Instagram strategy for your business, you might want to know that as of two weeks ago, Instagram is highly, uh, much more highly relevant to most of us now because they're making sure all of the text and associated images are now visible to search engines and Google. So there's a much bigger business benefit now for being present on Instagram than there was before. Um, so there's certainly something for you to be thinking about. Um, so uh, creating con becoming cr content creators is something that we all have to think about, you know, strategies for this. And the, the simple idea is play where your customers play. 
Uh, don't try, uh, don't be a busy fool. Don't go and try and be uh, you know, present and active on every single platform. Understand where your marketplace plays and play there well. Um, and with a thought leadership strategy if possible. Consumerism has changed beyond all recognition. Uh, millennials are less brand loyal. You know, if the products and services they buy every single day disappear tomorrow, they simply make a different choice. And that is largely based on social proof. So coming back to this age of due diligence that I was talking about earlier on, um, absolutely, if you are a millennial, you are searching and you're looking what your peers recommend. And that might actually just be in the, the form of on Facebook, can anybody recommend? Uh, and you are likely to make the decision based on peer, peer review and peer fee feedback. But I, I would imagine most of you, if you've looked for a holiday, a hotel or a restaurant, you've checked out um, TripAdvisor nowadays. I don't go anywhere else. Um, if you are connecting with somebody new for the first time, perhaps you're looking on LinkedIn to connect with them. In fact, uh, again, because this is a uh, um, more interactive, if you want to share your LinkedIn um, in the chat, I, let's make sure we connect. Mine is LinkedIn forward slash in forward slash Warren Cass. It would be great to connect with you. Um, and the point is, if you're being checked out, what are you doing to make the right first impression when people get to you? So if your product and service lends itself to uh, reviews on Amazon or Google, for example, have a strategy to make sure you're collecting good reviews. If your uh, product or service means they're going to check you out and do a bit of due diligence on LinkedIn, have a strategy that makes sure that people who love you are giving you great feedback on LinkedIn. It's really, really important nowadays. We need to stand out. So this was actually one of the trends um, and uh, because now actually most people have moved to online because we're having virtual meetings and virtual events and uh, virtual sales presentations, you know, whole industries now have just turned to Zoom rather than face-to-face uh, -face and probably will never go back. Because we're spending more on time online, actually we will be doing more of the due diligence, I believe too. The rise of the remote worker um, was a trend predicted before lockdown. Um, this is obviously true today too, uh, even more so. Uh, organizations have had to trust their staff to, rem uh, to work remotely and have suddenly realized the world didn't stop. It carried on. Oh my God, we, we don't need this big expensive real estate in central London anymore. In fact, a, a very dear friend of mine, a guy by the name of Tom Ball, runs a, a, a business called Desk Lodge, which was... Uh, in fact, for one of you said you were in Bristol. There's two desk lodges in Bristol. Um, and uh, Tom, uh, Tom has, has both of those. And they're really kind of groovy uh, places to, uh, to go and hang out uh, because every kind of meeting room is themed, et cetera. And what he realized is a lot of his clients decided they wanted to move out because they were now trusting people to work remotely. But larger organizations were suddenly saying, but we still see the value in bringing people together every now and then. So his business model adapted so he could actually accommodate larger organizations that just want maybe somewhere for a day a week where the whole team can come and co-locate and get their meetings out of the way and still have that kind of sense of collaboration. But for the rest of the day, they'll go and work um, from home again. Rest of the week, sorry, they'll go and work from home again. So, you know, this is also part of that change. The gig economy um, was set to double. I think that's, uh, that's, um, it, it's, it's more than doubled this year. There's a lot more to it. And what surprised me about the gig economy was actually the different generations' attitudes towards it. I thought it would be something really kind of fiercely resisted uh, by older generations. Um, uh, and, well, I think from Gen X to Boomer upwards, um, of which I sit in that camp, by the way. Um, but the, uh, the reality is everybody's embraced it, and particularly more so this year. Uh, so this was, um, this was data from 2016. But actually, this year, it's been embraced by everyone. The gig economy is the simple doing a job, uh, you know, isolated job for money. And the, the most futurists were predicting that uh, over the next kind of five years, most people would be developing portfolio careers anyway, which is multiple income streams for multiple things that they do. And what we try to do when we're working with people is understand where the time for money aspects are in your business and what can pay you while you sleep developing multiple propositions that give you residual as well as um, uh, time for money, but that's the premium product in your product staircase. How are we doing for time? Just gonna double check. We're doing all right. Um, so just let's take a pause here for this moment then. So ba based on what I've said so far, um, what's resonated? What's, um, what's made you think about your own business? 
what has uh, leapt out of the page at you? Um, what do you think is particularly relevant for your changing marketplace? God, there's too many. Um, uh, good to see that you're all interacted with the LinkedIn. It's great. I will make sure I record this. Um, but let's have some interaction. What's, what changes have happened in your marketplace this year? What have you been watching? What's been the significant impact to your marketplace this year? So definitely, um, Scott. Um, in fact, Scott might not be Scott, if I remember rightly. <laughs> in fact, you're, you're playing musical um, BBX uh, tags. Uh, you know, there's two John Attridges in the call now. I know Scott isn't Scott. Um, I think we should all just confuse each other. Should we just all change our names? Sod it. <laughs> More online business, great. Our business has gone totally, almost totally remote. Um, it's actually doubled, not slowed. Uh, that's, that's awesome to hear. I really love the good news stories from this year. This has been a, a, a great year to transform, right? This has been a, a great year to reevaluate the marketplace. It's been a great year to show the agility and to adapt um, and, you know, actually work on our professional development again. The amount of people who this year just decided, do you know what, I've been meaning to do this for years, I'm going to go and do this now. So it's one of the, the big things that, that's happened. And context really matters, absolutely. So on the screen, you can see about the experience economy. This is really interesting research that came out of, um, uh, out of last year. And again, it was largely targeting millennials, but it was looking at the, the different attitudes to where people prioritize spending now. And uh, the reality is that most of us gravitate towards an experience more than we do material things. So they did, a, did some research where they asked people, if you had a hundred pounds that you didn't or didn't have before, what would you spend it on? And 78% of millennials said they would spend it on, a, on an experience. And that was largely driven by a couple of uh, major factors. The first factor was that they, uh, they wanted to have social interactions off social media. Well, of course that's been hampered by this year. But the second, and I think the most important is they wanted a new perspective. They wanted to discover new perspectives. They were actually open and hungry for a different perspective. And so, uh, you know, the, the point is in your businesses, what can you do to make it more experiential? Uh, I was with um, a BBX client yesterday who um, was staying or just ha happened to be popping in at the, uh, the accommodation I stay at in Bournemouth uh, on BBX, uh, Boho House, shout out to Shanine, she's awesome. Um, but, uh, with Boho House, she had this uh, guy come in who sells a, 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 a very new type of vodka made from seaweed and a uh, phenomenal product, but he, he wasn't necessarily telling the story of the product. What people want is they want to understand now the, the backstory and they want to uh, have an experience with the product, the things that they buy. You know, if you've got this unique vodka and you've got friends coming over to share a drink with it, you want to be able to tell them the story. Of, of how it's made. And they're, they're now starting to take all of that storytelling throughout their business and all of the kind of video content they produce, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the opportunity for all of us now is to be more experiential in how we share what we do, telling the stories, not just of ourselves, but of our customers' experiences too. So what I want to do is I want to just um, spend a bit of time working on this and understanding this concept of the, um, the value proposition canvas. Um, so some of you may have seen this before, but I think this is the time for you to be revisiting this in your own business this year. The value proposition canvas is the simple premise that um, we have two, compete, com uh, two aspects when it comes to developing or designing a product or service to match the needs of our marketplace. And so on the one side, uh, where it says customer jobs, this is our this is our marketplace, right? This is our observation about the things that they do, and what we're looking out for are the the potential gains that they might uh, be able to uh, to get from working with us, and they might not be even aware that there was an issue or potential to gain. By the way, that's where the education and the thought leadership comes in, but we're also looking at the pains which they experience. Okay, 
And if we understand uh, the pains and the gains, um, we then potentially can we can craft a product or service. And this is about observation, okay? And the next part really is about creating products and services which give them either gain creation or pain relief, okay? And this is about design, okay? And where we have uh, a design that meets, uh, meets a, an observation, typically we will, uh, we will get a response and we will, we will be able to create a product or service. And the thing is, I guarantee all of you that the marketplaces that you serve right now have gone through some sort of turmoil and change this year. It's, a, it's an absolute guarantee. An exercise right now I'd just like you to do is I would like you to just give some consideration to your customer. And hopefully you've got some pen and paper in front of you. Um, just start brainstorming. What are the pains you think they were, were in as a marketplace? And by all means list prior to 2020 and as a result of 2020. Let's just um, flex the muscle. Uh, it was billed as a workshop, so let's have a little bit of interaction and, uh, and, and see if we can get some. So just start scribbling. I would like you to share maybe one or two of them in the chat also. Uh, if you want to share them all there, by the way, and not write them, by all means do so. But what are the pains, the new pains that your marketplace are in as a result of this year? And uh, I'll read some of these out and we'll... Uh, maybe explore a couple. So my confession is I moved out of my man cave for this presentation today because my man cave, uh, if any of you have got uh, wives like mine, um, you're not allowed to have anything blokey anywhere in the house except for your one designated room. And I figured that wasn't the room for today's presentation. So I came and sat by the Christmas tree, but it means I don't have my multiple screens, which I would normally have you guys so I could see your beautiful faces on one side and the chat on another screen and then my slides in front of me. So I'm juggling things as I speak to you. So let's have a look, lots of face-to-face -face sales opportunities. Do you know that's really interesting because uh, you know I was I was out to dinner last night outside I might add with um, one of my closest friends who's an IFA, and so if there's one thing that's happened this year is that the IFA industry has completely changed, um, completely changed. Uh, everything is done by Zoom now, and the, the conversation that we had last night is it's probably never going to go back to how it was. In fact. Even if uh, we, they, they are able to go and sit in front of people, the client, only probably about 20% of the clients will choose the face-to-face -face meeting. Um, so it, it's, it's a permanent change to that particular profession. So it's about adapting. And what I, I largely think what we're going to see over the next two years is huge evolutions in the features of uh, this type of video interaction. We're already seeing it. In fact, one to look out for is a brand called Mm-hmm. Yeah, I did say that without actually opening my mouth. It's spelled M-M-M-H-H-H-M-M-M, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's an app which will give you a whole load of interactive abilities on video on Zoom, uh, which, you, you you know, if any of you have downloaded and use OBS, you'll, you'll be familiar with one or two of the features. Wouldn't surprise me, actually, if Zoom ended up buying brands like this in order to integrate it into the platform. Because we're doing more online, they're going to be uh, making that... Um, uh, you know, in these kind of interactions even better. Great, I'm, we're getting some really good text through. I must make sure I re record this. Um, for the market people, go online, see online, do business with the products. Everything's online, it's, yeah, absolutely. Cut down staff, uh, automation's gonna be key. Who are your buyers? <laughs> <coughs> are you talking to me, Alex, or everybody? Everyone, yeah, who are your buyers? You've, you've clearly got fat fingers too because uh, they, you're doing what I do. Um, trust, trust is, trust is an interesting one. I think, I think we, we do have um, some differences with the, uh, how, we, how we generate trust and how we deal with people um, uh, now. And again, it comes back to this social proof age of due, due diligence, which I was talking about earlier on. Uh, we, we are going to have some challenges with this moving forwards. But there are, there are a couple of ways that we, we build trust. And so I will always come at things, as I said earlier on, through the lens of thought leadership. 
if we educate an audience and we demonstrate our expertise, they're more likely to want to come and work with us and gravitate towards us. So, uh, so you, can, you can absolutely um, uh, have a strategy to answer the questions of the biggest pain points of your marketplace. And what you're actually doing is creating conditions where people already trust you. Because we believe if marketing is done right, people, uh, by the time people hit your website, they've already made the decision to work with you. And in fact, it only takes a really clunky, horrible sales process to cock up that whole process, to cock up that. You know, if marketing is done right, people have already made the decision to work with you by the time they get to you, by the time you have a conversation. Um, sales is really just that kind of chemistry match as opposed to what it used to be, um, which was the kind of foot in the door, um, uh, sleazy closing. Um, if marketing is done right and we educate right, we, we have no need for that. I love the use of the word empathy now in, in, uh, in these things. The role of marketing is to make selling superfluous. I, I, I love that quote. Yeah, um, very good. Good. Okay, there's a good, good interaction there. Um, uh, hopefully that's just made you think about the needs of your customer. I, I, I kid you not, the value proposition here, the, the, the next thing I would encourage you to do from a value proposition point of view is to go and have a look at your competitors go and have a look at uh, and find exemplars, people of who you think are doing this type of business stuff well. And what I would encourage you to do uh, is, is to understand that today people buy from people. So it's much more important uh, for you to give uh, some of the kind of human qualities in your messaging. We firmly believe in values, demonstrating your values and talking about values. In fact, uh, we have a whole webinar uh, and workshop on this. If anybody's interested in coming along and doing a full day on identity alone and coming out of it with real clarity on what it is that makes you a personal brand and how that operates for your customers, either send me a private message or, or email me and we'll make sure that we get you an invite to the next workshop, which is in, um, in January, early January. Um, because the thing about understanding the values in your business, first of all, is what people connect with you. I'm sure all of you have met people before and taken an instant dislike or like to them. And that's typically where uh, behavior uh, uh, shows where your values are aligned or, um, or, or not. Um, so actually having values within your messaging is really, really important uh, and, and understanding what, how you articulate your, your kind of personal brand, really, really important. And you see a company, uh, we believe a brand that really embraces this uh, and builds on values and even recruits on values. If you recruit on values, what you create is a culture based on those values. Um, and let's, uh, let's put it this way, if, if that's the cultural experience of your organization, it becomes the customer experience because people demonstrate and practice those values. And that becomes the brand reputation, right? And so uh, going through these things and really getting these things right makes you very, very human because it's about H to H today, not B to B. Because a, a kind of closing thing for you, we've explored change a little bit today. It's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor, nor the most intelligent, but the one most adaptable to change. Now, this is a quote which is often falsely attributed to Charles Darwin. But I think in times of immense change, um, it's never been more relevant to think about this in your business. And all I wanted to do today was to provoke precisely that with you, was to think about all those different aspects of change, how it impacts your marketplace and what it is you can do. And uh, here is my email address. If anybody would like to connect with me, would like to come on to the Identity Workshop in January, we'd be more than happy to have you and we'll take you through all of those kind of values, uh, values bits and bobs too. But because we have a little bit of time left, let's have some questions and some Q&A. Happy to address any issue you might want to address. Great presentation, Warren. Uh, I'm sure the people on the call got some, uh, got some great value. So just... Um, Moving forward with some insights on change, uh, everybody can tell you what happened. Uh, but coming forward, is there any uh, other little things that you uh, think from your observations that are going to happen, let's assume, when, you know, in the next year or so when we get free of COVID? Well, I, I, I don't think there's, um, uh, first of all, there's, there's anything that's going to go back to normal. Uh, what we're going to do is spend the next two years figuring out what new normal looks like. And let me, uh, let me, prefix that by 
you know, just addressing the fact that change is constant and, uh, you know, normal is always going to be recalibrated, okay? Um, so regardless of, futurists will tell you that we were going to be moving away from ownership and uh, access was more important. Well, actually, this was the conversation I had last night. You know, my, my, my lovely car on the driveway is probably being driven twice a month. My friend I was with last night has got a Porsche, which costs him £800 a month in uh, fees and he drives it twice a month so that's 400 pounds per drive are you going to be making that um uh that cost justification on a car the the, the simple answer is no now we're already seeing apps and um uh, uh and tools which allow you to you know to go and just use an app and locate a car if you're living in a, a city like um zip cars for example and just go and pay by the hour on the car well you know when we're, we're moving much much quicker towards um uh autonomous driving cars uh, and it's going to be a case that you just order your car it'll turn up and it will take you to wherever you need to go on, on and you know the future is is absolutely going to be making those changes i had a, a deposit on a tesla this year in march and uh, lockdown happened i just cancelled it there was absolutely no point in having a car that i'm not going to need to use during lockdown and the reality is again twice a month maybe i jump in the car now um we just we just don't need the things that we had before uh, and this is this is going to impact us uh, because we're going to look for new ways um uh, to, to work new ways to do things um the business i started with warren knight uh, earlier this year was pre-lockdown we had no no idea lockdown was going to come uh, and our, our vision was to do kind of masterminding with entrepreneurs and business owners who were actually looking to go and raise their profile and do a little bit more in the thought, thought leadership space. And in our head, that was going to be delivered in five star hotels in various different places in the UK, but a UK audience. Well, the reality is this year is we've worked with 108 clients in 13 countries. And that was the opportunity of lockdown. And so, uh, so it really is about learning how to adapt, how to position, how, how to uh, how to see your market base. Not going to go back to normal. And anybody who tells you they can predict exactly how we're going to be working in five years has failed to um, calculate the innovation that's going to happen between now and then. Okay, and, it, and it's happening at such an incredible pace that really all you can be doing is constantly looking for how you can adapt constantly looking for that agility if you if you are um, building a whole new business proposition based on what you see right now tomorrow it's going to be obsolete so uh, as business owners our challenge is to be constantly adapting to be always looking to the next step but don't do it through our lens do it through the lens of our marketplace so it's observation remember the value proposition um, canvas it's observation then design and you need to be constantly recalibrating, constantly looking at the marketplace and understanding the impact to them. So, Warren, can I? Um, you said that um, Instagram has now become the second largest search engine to Google for a demographic. Yes, eighteen oh, yeah, to twenty-four year olds. That was what I was going to ask you. From for, was the was the demographic question? So. Um, and how, how is that, has that had an impact on your business? Or is um, that the wrong it, demographic? No, no, uh, it's the, the reason why I've taken Instagram more seriously. In fact, we've got a, a design campaign, which is, uh, it's been, we've been working on for the last week and uh, it goes live uh, this week uh, where um, every single day there's really engaging visual content, which uh, leads a thought process and drives people to content. The reason why we took it more seriously is the point I made earlier on. Two weeks ago, there was a significant change to Instagram, which made all of the text, the hashtags, and the, the copy that you use associated with an, in, uh, an image available to search engines. Right. That was a game changer. Um, that wasn't the case with Instagram before, and it's why some brands didn't take it seriously. But bearing in mind, um, you know, my favorite joke is, uh, where's the best place to hide a dead body? And the answer is the page two of Google. Okay, so most of us actually, I was in an audience once in, in America and I, I told that joke on stage and somebody in the audience shouted, oh, page one of Bing, which I think was actually a better answer. So I, I use that one now too. The, 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 point, the point is though, um, we're obsolete unless we're, we're uh, getting um, uh, good search results. And of course, there's lots of ways of being found in search engines. We can either use social media, which is 
um, SMM, so social media marketing. We can use, um, uh, we can pay search engine marketing, uh, uh, which is PPC, that type of thing. Or we can make sure everything that we create is highly optimized, so it's found by search engines. Um, so the, the, the point is that you should have strategies for all of these things, right? Um, but it starts with creating content. And not just creating content that you want to create, but creating content that's relevant to the pain and the gain of your marketplace. Okay, so what we're looking to be is found for the question, found for the things that they're searching for, you know, the solutions that they're searching for. Um, uh, so, you know, if, if your target demographic is 18 to 24 year olds, then Instagram is absolutely a way of doing it, but you need a little bit more than just a picture. Um, with, the, with Instagram, the recommendation is that you use 11 hashtags plus. Uh, on LinkedIn, you just use three and the three most important ones. And you have you build strategies for the different environments based on how their algorithms work. And so one of the things that we do with our members for LinkedIn, for example, is we have something called Buzz, which is uh, a feature for members who, when they create an article on LinkedIn, it gets, it, the most important time for an article on LinkedIn is the first two hours. Okay, the first two hours are when the algorithms start looking at uh, how engaged the content is. So what you really want in those first two hours are people not only to like, but to comment, and the comment should be more than five words for it to be meaningful. If you get, if you get some early interaction on LinkedIn with, with just those things, what happens is they push that content out to a much wider audience and you get a bigger chance. And we've done all the metrics on this, by the way. M members of ours, before using Buzz, were getting about, um, you know, 14, 15 views of a document and it's into thousands just by using um, uh, this, this uh, strategy of getting initial traction because suddenly it's opened up to the rest of the um, uh, rest of the platform. And, you know, if people comment on your stuff, make sure you respond. It all factors into the algorithms. Um, they want to see that you're engaging with your audience, not just putting stuff up there and being passive. So, you know, there are, there are strategies for each of the environments. And what I said earlier on is learn where your marketplace plays when you know where they play, make sure that you're, you've got focus strategies on them. We do cover all of this in the identity workshop. It was a genuine um, um, uh, offer to all of you. We're happy to take BBX for the identity workshop in, in January if you wanted to come along uh, and, and play for the day. But it's, it's, it, it's not for the faint hearted, our workshops. You are, there is work to do. Um, by the end of the day, we will have done quite a lot and really looked at the marketplace and certainly looked at you in a lot more detail. But if anybody's interested in that, I did share the email address. It's warren at warrencast.com and I'll make sure you've got the details for that. Are there any other questions? I could evangelize about this stuff for the whole day. Um, so uh, I don't care what you throw at me, we can we can have a conversation. If you prefer to have a, uh, an interaction uh, beyond this, uh, again, pop me an email with a question. I'll happily respond and give you some insight. Uh, particularly as I'm, as you can see, in a bit more holiday mode now. We we finished our last accelerator last week, and uh, we don't start the next accelerator until the 18th of January. So I've got quite a bit of time now to uh, to create and write my new book. But anybody out there, I've known Warren for a long time, and really appreciate it today, Warren, the input, and I'm sure other people will. But one of the things Warren is really great at is building communities, building thought leader groups, and so. Anybody that's out there thinking of joining one of these groups, you will get fantastic value from it. I sat on one of Warren's mastermind groups for a year and uh, every single time I went along, I learned something new. So I'd fully recommend it. Very kind of you to say tennis in the post, John. <laughs> Thank you very much, Warren. That was a, a really great presentation. I know everybody appreciated it and um, thank you very much. So I, I haven't had a chance to read all of the chat. Um, uh, so is it, and at the moment it's not letting me save that in the usual way. Um, so is there any chance you could send me the chat, guys? We'll definitely, we'll definitely do our best if we can I, work out the technology. I would just like to make sure I've not missed a question. And if uh, if I have missed a question or something, I will make sure I come back and respond to people individually. Well, and I have, uh, I have uh, saved that chat and I can send it to you. Uh, did you say Warren at warrencast.com? Absolutely, I will. Uh, I, in fact, I will do two things in the chat right now. I will, yeah. I will add my email address, and I will add our our website. You've added an extra S in CAS on the, by the looks of things. Oh yeah, I'm, LinkedIn. Do you know it's fat fingers? Uh, they, I did tell you. I I, I was uh, 
at the front about my fat fingers. And Probably there not is... as fat because you <laughs> spelt it right. <laughs> yeah, so Cass is just two S's, uh, not not three. And there's, there's okay. the website too. So I'd love to connect with you. I, in fact, um, I've got a, a, an ebook just about to come out, um, which is called Great Business by Design. And I would love to send you a copy of it. So you can if, put uh, that in the um, goodie bag, I, Warren, for the event. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. I, well, it, it, it's not going to be ready for a couple of weeks yet because oh, I'm still okay. in the middle of writing it, but absolutely it's available for people if they want to, to read it. But, um, um, but listen, you've been the most attractive audience I've spoken to today. So thank you very much for your time and attention <laughs> and uh, hope to engage with you beyond. Have a Merry Christmas. Thank you, Warren. Great time. Thanks, uh, Warren. That was great. It was very, very good. Useful.